embarrassed to tell you that I was pulled over once. Um, and, <laughs> Did and you have a license? I had a license. <laughs> but it was a teaching moment for my sons because when I was pulled over, I said, all right, I want you to pay attention to what I do. And oh, okay. so I, I pulled over. I let the window down. I kept my hands on the steering wheel. And I said, it's very important that you model, that, that I'm modeling this for you, so I want you to pay attention. Yeah. When the officer came to the window, he said, may I have your, may I have your driver's license? And I said, officer, um, uh, I have my license in my pocket. I'm going to grab it. I get it, pull it out. I give it to him. So you and, tell the officer yeah, first that yeah, you're going to yeah, I'm not going to make any sudden movements. I'm going to tell yes. him what, I, what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And it's a respectful conversation. That's right. Yes. It's a, it was, uh, in fact, he uh, didn't give me a ticket and right. said I was the most polite person he pulled over there in the last go. week. There you go. Um, mm -hmm. And so I mm -hmm. think that that idea, right, that you're interacting with respect yes. is crucial. That's right. Yes. Okay. So that's really important that the parents have the conversation with the children that you shouldn't be driving if you don't have a license. Um, but if you're driving and you're pulled over, be respectful to the police officer. Um, comply with the requests they make. Put your hands where they can see your hands and have a respectful conversation. Now, here's the thing. Many of our young people resent having to, they call it kowtowing to or, you know, to the police. They see it as almost an oppressive Right. type of interaction. How would, should parents address that? So, so some of, you know, a, a lot of how police are viewed in the community come from the house. Yes. And so if the house is saying, you know, the police don't do anything but beat up everybody, they'll never do nothing for us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you will see the, the caricature of, the, of where police stand mm -hmm. from society to society. And, and, I, and I can tell you, if the society is more wealthy, if the community is more wealthy, they love the police, love them. You go into the poor neighborhoods, hate the police. Now, but it changes because, you know, I'm from a poor neighborhood and I have offices in, you know, a poor neighborhood in Dixville and I spend a lot of time in Dixville, New Hallville. Mm -hmm. I don't have problem people, you know. Um, that's me as an individual police officer, um, but Overall, their view of the police is 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 not. They're not happy. They're not. You know, it's, it's not a happy view of the police. So, what needs to happen is this: parents need to have a real conversation with their child. You know what? Out there, you're going to have people who are going to do some good things. You have people do some bad things. You can't let this incident recently with officer shot the guy ten times. Don't let that be the only view your child has of the, police. the police. Because yeah. when something happens especially for black men in America, young black male who the leading cause of death for them is gun violence, that means mm -hmm. you're gonna likely get shot by another black male. And before you get shot yes. by that black male, you're gonna have an incident that you could have went and contacted the police to help them intervene, as we talked about, as you talked about yes. with the fight. Yes. But if your view is, you know, forget about the police, or we're not gonna get involved with the police. And the other thing too is, parents can understand this, because your child's not listening to you and gets away with it, don't expect everybody else to put up with that nonsense. If you want to chicken out yes. and don't want to come up with other solutions to address your child's behavior because you missed some steps or you're just tired, that's on you. But understand when it comes to the police, final authority, the end. As I say in the book, you know, the police is not the teacher in school. You know, they can end the conversation at any given time. And they can take, make it long or short, and they can end it with an arrest, you yes. know, or they can end it with you walking away with bad feelings. But it's not like you going to school and arguing over a grade. It's it's a different conversation. Well, just to, uh, okay, I, I, before you okay. tell us, I want to give the, um, the viewers some information. Um, we want to help you to navigate the system if your child happens to get arrested someplace. If your child happens to get arrested, first thing, the contact, um, if your child is in the state, with the state already or in the system, your contact for the Department of Children and Families Juvenile Justice Services is 860-550-6529. If your child is in the system already, adjudicated, 
committed delinquent and you have questions or concerns, you would call 860-550-6529. If your child, uh, if you live in New Haven and your child is someplace, or, or your child gets arrested at school and is locked up someplace and you need to get help, your first line of defense is to contact the court support services as the location where your child is arrested. The second person to contact is the clerk at the juvenile clerk's office. And then the third one is the juvenile probation officer at that location where your child is locked up. If all of this fails and you can't get answers, call the statewide information service at 211. Tell them where your child has been arrested, what town, and all that, and they will be able to provide you with assistance, give you directions about where to go. Also, the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center, CPAC, and the web link is showing on your screen, and the number is 800-445-2722. These are important numbers. And remember, NABLO, go to the website for um, NABLIO and get information about what it is that this National Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers do. But it's really many, many different yes. colors. It's Asian and yes. Hispanics and everything. Um, so go there and get more information. We already gave you also the one for the toolkit, which is really important. Now, go ahead. Well, um I actually wanted to shift the topic a little bit. Sure, go and, ahead. You and, guys have the floor now for the next 10 minutes. Okay, good. I, I actually wanted to talk a, a little bit with, with the two of you about um, one of the issues that I think is a, is a primary challenge for our, our boys and, and young girls in the okay. black community, and, and that is whether fathers are engaged uh, with them yes. or not. Um, and the experience of fatherlessness for many of our young people, mm -hmm. um, and, and I want to underscore that, that being uh, fatherless takes on many different shades. Yes. You know, you might lose a father because he was in the military and mm -hmm. he died fighting for the country mm -hmm. and he died a hero, right? 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 And that's a different kind of loss. And whether you experience that loss at six or 15 impacts you differently. You might lose a father because he's incarcerated. And that's a different kind of loss. You might lose a father because there was a divorce and a breakup and the father leaves and is no longer involved. Um, so how the father uh, is uh, not engaged is, is important in terms of how young people grow and experience um, mm -hmm. who they're becoming as men. So I, I want to talk about black boys in particular. The, the idea of fatherlessness is one of the things that we need in our community to try to fix. Um, because when fathers aren't involved, the statistics for young people really hit, hit the mm -hmm. ground floor. You know, it increases substance abuse. It increases interactions with uh, the criminal justice system it increases poor performance in, in the educational system. All the indicators are, are negative, not, not positive. And so I guess the point I wanted to drive home um, for uh, folks in the community is that they need to think about, um, so how do I engage a child's father in his life even if I am not interacting with him in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So how do you create a positive holding environment as two parents who are no longer together in the service of your kid? Um, there's a phenomenon called father hunger where kids as they grow up with a missing father will begin to create ideas about who that person is in the absence of information about him, right? And so that father hunger then will drive a kid's uh, interest in defining who he is as a man or as a woman as she grows up. In the few minutes we have left, and we have less time than I realize, what, as a police officer who have interacted, who has interacted with so many young people, what would you say, what's the fix? What's the, what, give me three quick things that mothers who are not married or who don't have the father or fathers of their children in their lives, what can they do to help to 
to correct that breach. Many of our men are incarcerated. Right. What can the women do, especially those young women who themselves never had fathers in their lives? What can they do? So, you know, I'll use the, the model that, you know, my, my family used. My, my mother had me when she was like 15. And when I was growing up, my mother was, um, she was like uh, the sex police, you know. Her number one mission in life was I was going to graduate high school and go to college. And I was not going to have any children until I got married. So it can change. And, it doesn't have to and, follow and, the, yeah. And so I did not have any children until I got married. Um, and what my mother made it very clear, this is what happened with me at a young age with your biological father. You have to break the cycle. I think what has to happen right now in America, mm -hmm. every black man and woman has to stop in their space, look at where they're at, and say, we have to break this cycle. I can't go out tonight and just sleep with anybody I want at the, after the club and maybe get pregnant because there's a fail safe and whatever. No, we can't do that. We need to stop having babies out of wedlock. That's a fact. We just need to stop doing it. It doesn't have to happen. There's no benefit to it. Right. We need to stop damning the child's father of our child and creating these, these fictitious barriers to keep the person out of the life. And the fathers need to be men. They need to grow up, stop being a punk, mm -hmm. and be men. Stop blaming everything. Of, or the, bragging about how many system, children they have with bring, so many different mothers. Well, but we're, you know, we're, let's be, be honest. You know, we're blaming stuff on the white man. We're blaming things on the system. We're blaming things on them and they. We need to take ownership. Black men need to take ownership. I'm not a special father. I'm not a special black guy. It's hard being a father. It's yes. hard being a husband. It's hard being a son. It's hard being focused on trying to build on our forefathers. But that's our job. And so it's easier to do it when we're spiritually rooted. Yes. And so that's the other thing. You know, if you're Christian, take your butt back to church. Stay in church and do what you're supposed to be doing. If you're Muslim, go do what you're supposed to be doing. But stop playing around. People are playing but your around. Mother, your mother had you at 15, but she was able to break. She didn't bring you up into. So whereas now we make the excuse that many of our young mothers didn't have any fathers in their life and they don't know how to be mothers. How did your mother break the cycle? Well, we had a network, you know. So it, my situation was a little bit more unique. I mean, I was raised... Um, also by my grandmother who's 80, who yes. I have a great relationship with. I see her every other day on a regular basis. Um, and my grandfather who's 85, who I, you know, I work with him now as well. Uh, my grandparents became my, my yes. surrogate parents. I had great Same uncles yes. who are still alive, 93 mm -hmm. and 80. So, so I have a very large family. An extended family. In yes. my family, yes. my New Haven family, my down south family, are not criminal families. They were hard workers. All my great uncles owned houses in West Haven. They built their houses from ground up. In the 1970s, when black people was marching and protesting, my grandfather built the house from the ground up in West Haven working in a sewage plant. Yes, so, 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 so let, because we only have a few minutes left, I, I want you to say to people watching, how for that young woman tonight who is 17 years old and pregnant, and whose mother had her when she was 15 or whatever, what do you say to her about that child she's carrying? Where does she start today? You know, it's simple, and I know it sounds corny, but, you know, she has to take her child, get to a quiet place, and pray to God and ask for God to give her guidance and make a commitment between herself and that child and God to not make the mistakes of her parents. And read to her child from the, from, in fact, you know, um, read to your child, and I know this sounds corny, but I remember my <laughs> husband used to read to my son in my stomach. Absolutely. You know, and when he was an infant, we read to him all the time, and I see him doing the same to his children now. Um, it is so important, it is so important that we believe that we can change things. It, it's, it's not, I know that I have gotten criticized for, you know, people will say to me, well, you didn't know what it was like to be this, or, you know, 
and and I must tell you, I had a wonderful childhood. With like you, I had great grandparents. You know, I was raised by my great grandparents. But you don't have to be born wealthy or with all of that to do well as a parent. You have to read to your child. You have to count ten when the child does something instead of smacking and screaming. You count ten. You take a deep breath and you cuddle your child and. You really, really try your best to be the best parent you can every day. And the last word I want to hear from you about what do you say to those young black men who think they have no future? They have no future. Um, wow. Uh, you know, I, I deal with this regularly with, with the yes. young men that I work with yes. who will often say, what's the point? Um, yes. I'm going to live to 18 yeah. or 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. And what I say to them and what I would say to them is you have to have hope um, that we have to help. Our families mm -hmm. need to help with this. Our teachers need to help with this. We need to instill hope in them so that they yes. can develop a future perspective so they can imagine themselves five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. We have to expose them to a much bigger world than what they are typically exposed to mm -hmm. through Xbox or the four block radius. Mm -hmm. And we have to show them that the world is much bigger and creative. Every young person that I encounter has a hook. If you listen to them, they will tell you what they're passionate about, Yes. where their dreams really are, despite all the obstacles that they have, I'm always listening for where that hook is, and as soon as I discover it, I grab it. So we need to talk to them and listen to them.